This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229, MRI Signals and Sequences, offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The fifth lecture, MRI Imperfections Part 1, is broken down into three parts, and Lecture 5A covers gradient nonlinearity. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to understand that we assume linear gradient performance is, li is linear, explain the impact of nonlinear gradients on slice selection, describe the impact that nonlinear gradients have on image encoding, and appreciate that gradient distortions can be corrected. I've used this slide in some of the previous talks to discuss some of our B-field assumptions in MRI, and here we focus on those associated with gradient fields. And generally in, in MR, we assume that gradient fields are perfectly linear over space. We call this gradient linearity. We also assume that they're temporally modulated exactly as specified, and we don't typically include uh, Maxwell terms or Maxwell fields. These latter two topics we'll discuss in the subsequent lectures, but this lecture is focused on the assumption of perfect linearity over space. This is the mathematical description that we provided for the gradient fields previously. We, in MR, we generally work with the terms on the right-hand side. We apply a specific amplitude for a gradient field in a particular direction, the x, y, or z gradient, and the magnetic field generated by that gradient depends on the position relative to isocenter. And the product of the gradient amplitude and the position produces a magnetic field. That magnetic field we subscript as being the G field, the gradient field. It points only along the Z direction. And in the case of an X gradient, it varies only with the X direction. The linearity is seen in this term here, where the gradient amplitude linearly multiplies onto spatial position. In the case of a linear X gradient, we might expect the B field generated from the gradient to decrease on the left-hand side and increase on the right-hand side in a linear fashion. Now, in the presence of nonlinear gradients, the spatial distribution of B field generated by a nonlinear gradient will be a nonlinear uh, function of space. And this will create several different problems, especially when it comes to image encoding. So why are the gradients nonlinear in the first place? Well, to begin with, there's some design considerations. These may include the, ta the target geometry, that is, the kinds of objects or subjects uh, you plan to image. And we also need to do things like limit peripheral nerve stimulation. A consequence of a fast switching gradients uh, can lead to peripheral nerve stimulation, something the FDA, of course, regulates. And, and gradient uh, hardware design has to take into consideration the potential for gradient uh, or peripheral nerve stimulation. There's also, of course, engineering constraints, things like power delivery and dissipation. And uh, as an example, if we want really high gradient maximums and very high slew rates, something that generally is preferred for uh, high sequence performance, we may have to compromise on linearity to get those gains uh, in terms of just an engineering trade-off. So here we've uh, mapped out the three different gradient fields, that is the B fields that are generated uh, as a consequence of the GX, the GY, or the GZ gradient. In principle, we can just focus on, on understanding one of these gradient fields, and, um, and, and uh, of course this leads us to better understanding the other gradient fields as well. So remember that uh, in the case of slice selection, we apply a gradient, say the Z gradient, and that will produce a distribution of uh, magnetic field over space. And that distribution of magnetic field uh, over space, when dotted uh, or multiplied with uh, the spatial positions of interest or uh, a spatial uh, range of spatial positions of interest, uh, the product of these things with the gyromagnetic ratio will give us a range of frequencies associated with this range of positions. In the case of something like slice-selected excitation, we refer to delta omega as the excitation bandwidth. That is, we need an RF pulse that contains this range of frequencies so that we can excite spins that, are, that, are, uh, ocup that occupy uh, spatial positions in this range of Z positions, for example. So let's map this out. Here we have uh, the Z direction. So you can think of this as the head-foot direction of the scanner. And when we turn on a gradient, like a GZ gradient, we now have a mapping that I'm showing here in this blue line that maps spatial positions to frequency. 
of course, if we steepen this line, that's a stronger gradient, and we have a different relationship between the frequencies and the positions. So let's say that we want to, uh, we have an RF pulse with an excitation bandwidth of roughly, say, two to four kilohertz. If I have an RF uh, uh, pulse that contains these specific frequencies, it will map according to the gradient that I'm applying to these particular spatial positions. And so effectively, if this is an excitation pulse with this excitation bandwidth, I'm exciting spins that occupy uh, this uh, specific location. And we can think of this as being a slice or a slab. Here it's shown uh, rather thick just because it's easier to draw this way. So what happens in the context of gradient nonlinearity? Well, if we have nonlinear gradients, we have a different mapping of uh, magnetic field strength uh, as a function of position. And so here we've introduced a new term, which is that the GZ gradient, for example, depends on some function of space as well as time. We turn our gradients on and off, and then we still dot with a spatial position. And so now the map, because of the spatial dependence term, we have a different frequency to space mapping uh, that may have some uh, you know, curved form that could be a quadratic function, a cubic function, or expressed in some other way. And in fact, we'll discuss this a little bit later in this lecture, but when it comes to completely characterizing uh, nonlinearities, we may choose to do so with what are called spherical harmonics. And probably the idea of, say, a quadratic or a cubic curve is relatively straightforward, and they're good for describing one-dimensional changes. Spherical harmonics are nice low-order functions for describing, say, spatial distributions of any field uh, with a compact number of terms. Okay, so let's think about what happens in the case of slice selection uh, with a nonlinear gradient. So we're going to assume the same excitation bandwidth. We still have delta omega. We're still playing the same GZ gradient. And for the, in the case of a linear gradient, we know that this range of excitation frequencies will map to these specific spatial positions. Now, the mapping, of course, is different in the presence of a nonlinear gradient. And so here we show that those same frequencies would map out to a different point on our gradient curve and, of course, cause us to excite a different range of spatial positions for the exact same frequencies that were applied in our RF pulse. So if we don't know that our, linear, uh, that our gradient is performing nonlinear, nonlinearly, then the RF pulse that we're using will excite a very different slice than the one we had in mind or targeted. And there's actually several consequences here uh, that we'll discuss uh, as, the, as the lecture proceeds. One of which you'll notice here is that the slice uh, is displaced in its position. Uh, the slice thickness is also different, although it's a little hard to see here. You can notice that the gradient here has gotten steeper, uh, and that leads to um, a, a difference in slice thickness between the linear and nonlinear gradients. So we have shifts, we have uh, changes in slice thickness, and in fact, we can have other uh, slice-related distortions as well. Uh, and we'll develop these concepts uh, in just a few minutes. So what if the distortion is a more general function of space, so rather than just being, say, a simple function of space uh, that is along the same direction uh, as the applied gradient? Maybe it uh, varies in perpendicular directions as well. Uh, or it could be a more complicated function of space generally. And so here, what we're implying is that the, the normal GZ gradient could be applied. This would be the linear gradient example. And it, of course, maps frequencies to Z positions in space. Now, it may be the case in the, uh, uh, in the context of a nonlinear gradient that this mapping is a function not of Z, but all, not only of Z, but also of, say, X. And so we have different nonlinear curves depending on where we are along the X axis as well. And this is, creates uh, you know, a fair bit of complexity, but it also suggests that these nonlinearities uh, are spatially distributed across X, Y, and Z for a Z gradient, as well as X, Y, and Z for an X gradient or even a Y gradient. So let's look at this example again and, and think about what it would do in terms of slice excitation. And so if we have the same excitation bandwidth, that maps out to a range of frequencies, and we have a nice... Uh, let's say um, uh, we're, we're exciting a nice linear range of uh, spins. Um, in the case of a nonlinear gradient, uh, it means that we'll be exciting this sort of what sometimes is called a potato chip. Uh, we have this unusual isosurface of spins. Uh, 
And that's because the gradient itself uh, is mapping uh, these frequencies to an unusual range of positions across the slice itself. So the slice becomes non-planar or potato chipped. All right, so let's think about a question. You can pause the video if you need to while you think about this one. Which of the following problems arises during slice selection if the gradients are nonlinear? Do we have a slice position shift, a slice thickness shift, a slice profile distortion, a slice geometry distortion, or all of the above? And the answer, of course, is all of the above are possible. Okay, so what does gradient nonlinearity do to images? We talked about what it does to slices. What does it do to images? So what looks unusual in this image? Go ahead and pause the video for a second, look at it, and see if you can identify a couple features that seem unusual. The things that stand out to me in this video is the geometry. Even if I don't know exactly what this object is, the geometry seems a little bit strange. It looks maybe sort of pinched at the top uh, and the bottom, uh, or perhaps kind of more wide or broad sort of in this midsection here. You also notice a gradient in signal intensity where there's a bunching up of signal. Things look a little bit brighter in this region here and they look a little bit brighter in this region here. And that kind of tapers off as you get to the edges of the image. Here's the undistorted image. And so we can go back and forth between these two images and you can see that in fact, there is quite a bit of distortion in signal intensity pile up as a consequence of gradient nonlinearity for in-plane imaging. So this is the distorted image as a consequence of nonlinear gradients. And this is what can be uh, reconstructed if we understand the nonlinear performance of the gradient system. And so what kinds of features do we observe? Well, before uh, the image is, is corrected, we see image distortions and signal pileups. And afterwards, the image ge geometry, of course, has been restored and the image intensities have been corrected. You'll also notice in the periphery of this image here that there's blank image pixels. And that's because the geometry of the acquired information had to be distorted in such a way that there was no relevant information to reconstruct into particular areas at the edges of the field of view. And so this is one way to identify whether an image has undergone uh, nonlinear gradient uh, correction or not. If you see these blank uh, sort of edges in your images, it's almost certainly undergone uh, nonlinear gradient correction. Okay, so let's remember this. Let's think about uh, sort of why this happens in the first place. Why do nonlinear gradients cause the kinds of problems that we're seeing? So the first thing I want uh, to touch on is the relationship between applied gradient waveforms, G of T, and where we are in K-space. So K-space uh, at a point in time, that is as the pulse sequence is progressing, is just um, the integral of the gradient waveform. And so here uh, we can play this video again. And from the, from the beginning, we can see that as we're mapping out, as we're playing our gradient waveform in blue, we're moving our, uh, along K-space as well. And on the right-hand side here, you can see the units for K-space in terms of cycles uh, per meter in this case. So why is this important? Well, it's really important because it plays into the signal equation. This is the MR signal equation that tells us how the transverse magnetization for uh, the underlying object that we're trying to image is multiplied by these spatial frequency patterns that are tied to K-space, which in turn is, of course, tied to our gradient waveforms. And if we integrate uh, this, that is, we detect it with an underlying coil, it tells us about the magnitude and phase of, of K-space at a particular point that we're visiting. And the point that we're visiting, of course, depends in, on time, where we are in a particular gradient waveform. So in the simple case, uh, we have something like this. We're playing gradients, and if they're performing linearly, then as I'm moving through K-space, I'm... I'm imparting a phase pattern and printing a phase pattern on my underlying object. In this underlying object, all the spins, of course, are processing. That's what enables detection. And at every point uh, in K-space that I visit, I sample my signal and I record it to a point in K-space. And so these three movies are synchronized. So I'll let them play for a couple cycles, but let's talk through one from the very beginning. So here we have the readout prephaser and we begin to put phase on our underlying spin system and move out to K-space. Now we're reading out across uh, K-space. We're coming into our echo, and you can see that we've just left the echo position and we're streaming across to the right again. 
I think this is a nice movie, uh, a nice slide rather, that links together gradient waveforms, k-space as a function of time, the spatial frequency patterns that we use for imaging, how we integrate that information into the, the magnitude and phase to report a particular point in k-space. And if we visited enough points in k-space, here we're not showing phase encoding, uh, then we will have sampled all of the k points that we need so that a Fourier transform will help us recover the underlying uh, image of the object. Now, fundamentally, we actually assume that the gradients are linear. We're assuming that when we play gradients, we're actually sampling these specific patterns, and we know that we should put the measured information into a very specific point in k-space. But when the gradients are nonlinear, this assumption falls apart a little bit. So, in general, we assume the gradients perform linearly, and we record data and assign it to a particular k-point, but we didn't actually sample a spatial frequency when we're using nonlinear gradients, and we don't even assign the data to the right k-point. So now let's look at what's happening in this uh, movie here, where uh, mathematically I've manipulated the sampling functions to have some spatial dependence uh, that would accord with uh, a possible gradient nonlinearity. And so now my spatial frequency weighting patterns are no longer these nice uh, sort of rectilinear patterns, but in fact uh, start having some curvature and banding sort of associated with, with them. Uh, and this means that I'm no longer sampling the k-space that I thought I was. I'm sampling some distorted version of k-space. But if I don't know my gradients are non-uniform, I still pack it into the same point in k-space. I still store it where I thought uh, uh, I was recording data. And then as a consequence of having recorded all of that data and taking an FFT, I'll actually um, ob obtain a distorted image. So the image distortion is really a function of not having done the encoding uh, correctly. That's sort of a, an inverse way of thinking about this. Okay, so which of the following problems arises during image encoding if the gradients are nonlinear? You can pause the slide while you think about this. Is it in-plane distortion? Does it cause in-plane shifts? Does it cause intensity modulations? Or does it cause phase errors? And perhaps not surprisingly, the answer is all of the above. Each of these is possible. So how do we go about correcting gradient nonlinearities? Well, the most common way, and this is typical of most manufactured system, is you would have some method for mapping the B fields. And you would do this at the time of installation and thereby be able to characterize a specific imaging system uh, at its installation location. That B-field mapping can be modeled or fitted using, for example, spherical harmonics. These are uh, three-dimensional spatial functions, and a, a low number of them can model uh, magnetic field distributions reasonably well and compactly. We could use that B-field uh, modeling or fitting to then estimate the actual B field. So we know what we tried to apply, uh, but then we know that our system in fact does something else. And if we know the B field estimation, we can in fact determine a displacement estimation. That is, given a set of gradient waveforms and the known uh, nonlinearities, we can correct uh, our images by estimating a displacement field. And that displacement field will, be that will then be used to push or, or pull our images back into the appropriate geometry. And so if we have a distorted image or an uncorrected image that looks like this, this is a grid phantom. You can see the lines bend a little bit uh, as a consequence of gradient nonlinearity. We can apply this uh, displacement estimation uh, from the known field uh, perturbations and consequently recover, uh, recover a corrected uh, image. The actual details of going about this are, are a little bit complicated, uh, but we'll, in, in the live lecture, we'll run through some uh, MATLAB scripts that help us better understand this. Uh, another possibility, another sort of clever uh, consideration here, is that you could, in fact, use uh, these nonlinear gradient fields for imaging itself. And so if you really understood uh, the nonlinearities of your system, you might think of novel ways to use them for encoding, uh, perhaps uh, uh, having a uh, temporal efficiency or time efficiency or other characteristics that are advantageous. It's a complicated uh, area of research, uh, but it's another way of, take, of, of leveraging uh, the inherent nonlinearity of a system. So in summary, let's remember that there's a basic assumption in MR uh, 
uh, that the Z component of the B field created by the gradient coils varies linearly with X, Y, or Z over the field of view. In fact, we know our gradients to be nonlinear, and gradient nonlinearity causes several problems, including slice distortions, in-plane geometric distortion, and intensity distortions. And gradient nonlinearity can be measured, modeled, and used for image, and mag image magnitude and phase correction. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about phase corrections, but anytime the magnitude of our signal is corrupted, the phase is corrupted as well. If you would like to continue studying this topic, here's a few papers that I would suggest, including some work uh, done here at Stanford in, uh, about a decade ago. Okay, so in the next lecture, we'll address some other considerations about how else gradients can perform imperfectly, and we'll talk about eddy currents and Maxwell terms in particular. So thanks for joining us. Uh, please click the links below if you'd like to continue with the lecture series. Thank you.